My name is Kate Brady, and I'm the Immigration Department Head for the Constitutional Law Center for Muslims in America. I'd like to welcome you to this webinar, and today we're going to be talking about asylees and that process along with how it intersects with CLCMA, and then I'm going to give you a little peek behind the curtain as far as how our organization works, and hopefully this will give you a little bit of information that can be useful to either you or someone you know. And I look forward to having this opportunity to share this with you. So let's get started. Asylum. This is a form of relief in our immigration system that is to protect people who are in the United States but meet the definition of a refugee. We have another webinar that's about a refugee status. And those are for people who are similarly situated, but they're outside the United States. There are two types of asylum. The first is what we call affirmative asylum, and the second is what we call defensive asylum. And I'm gonna break that down a little bit for you. So this is an application that you can make regardless of your country of origin, but as you'll see, some countries lend themselves better to the asylum process than others because it is based on being a refugee or having that same fear of persecution. So people who come to the United States to seek this protection have either suffered or fear that they're gonna suffer persecution based on their race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group or political opinion. Some people within this administration, such as the current acting director of the asylum office, believe that there should also be a requirement that they first try to relocate internally within their home country, but that is not the current state of the law. That persecution also has to be very specifically from either that country's government or another authority or group where the government is unable to control them. This means that private individuals and certainly in the way that our current administration and the past administrations have looked at this, gangs do not count. They are considered private individuals. So when you're thinking about all these uh, applications for asylum and maybe the southern border where they're coming from Central America, where there's maybe the MS-13 gangs in El Salvador, or even the Zetas in Mexico, those are not going to work for an asylum claim. So the first type of claim that we're going to talk about is an affirmative asylum claim. An affirmative asylum claim means that you're making this application to USCIS. They are an agency, not a court, and not any of these things that you've maybe heard about as far as down at the border. They are screening people through CBP. This is actually in the United States, an application that you make to USCIS. It's on a form I-589, and you need to make that within one year of your arrival. So that means it could be the day you arrive or up to that one year, and there is no fee currently, but there is a proposed fee. So when your country is in turmoil or you're fearing persecution, maybe there's one group that is against another right now in the government, and you're part of the group that is being persecuted, that's something that can change over time. If it gets worse, that actually makes your application for asylum stronger, but obviously there could be improved country conditions. And that's something that the asylum officer will always be looking at. The example I gave here is the China one child policy, which they say they have now loosened. That used to be a very common claim for Chinese nationals, and it is no longer as common because it is not seen as a policy. Your application will receive an interview at the USCIS Asylum Office. We'll talk a little bit about the priorities of interviews a little bit later. And then also where you apply is going to vary greatly on if it did or not. And so where you live is what's gonna control which asylum application office is going to see your application. So if you live in Texas or in the surrounding jurisdictions interviewed at the Houston Asylum Office, but if you live maybe in the Southern California area, you could be maybe interviewed in Los Angeles. And Los Angeles may have a much more lax policy. You can actually see the statistics for granting here at this website. So the alternative to an affirmative asylum is a defensive asylum. And this is actually one that I would not want people to have to be making because it means that you are in immigration court. You are in deportation or what is technically called removal proceedings. We are trying to get you out of the country. And this is you telling the judge, I can't leave because I will be persecuted if I leave. And so you are defending the government's try to deport you from the United States with that claim of asylum. And so the immigration judge is gonna be the decision maker at this point. 
you still make that same application, but you're making it to the judge and he will have that hearing and there will be an evidentiary hearing where there will be testimony. Most often the asylee is going to testify. The government will also be allowed to cross-examine witnesses. Many times within removal proceedings, that person who is asking for asylum will also be asking for the withholding of removal and a separate application for withholding of removal under the Conventions Against Torture, which we often abbreviate as CAT. The problem there is that either withholding of removal or withholding of removal under CAT, there is no path to green card as there is with the asylum grant. There's no permission to travel. If you do travel, you are basically deporting yourself and you will not be allowed to return to the United States lawfully unless you have another way to qualify for that return. They may also, the government may also try to deport you to a safe third country. It's rare, but it could actually happen. So we discussed this also in our refugee webinar, whether or not your spouse and children can be either with you in the United States under your asylum claim, or can they come from abroad? So the first one is if they're with you. And your case may include your legal and lawful spouse, and that is determined by where the marriage took place, and also your children who are unmarried and under 21. That meets the statutory or regulatory definition of what a child is under the U.S. immigration law. So it's not 18, but it's before your 21st birthday and you have to be unmarried. So if somebody is outside the U.S. and it is your spouse or child, they can also be part of your case, but they are doing what we call following to join. So again, it's your spouse or unmarried child. You must file within two years of arriving in the United States and that is within your application. So you're not going to file for them to follow to join until you have an application. And there is a centralized consular post that are now doing those following to join applications. So it may or may not be the one that is closest to your spouse and children, and you can find those here. This is actually under the most recent uh, changes that this administration are doing. There's a presidential proclamation that addresses immigrants and refugees and all of that. So they have done that to centralize the process. Currently, this doesn't really exist since all of the consulates and embassies are closed, but it is something in a normal time that would be part of the process. So there's a very odd way that the current administration is processing cases. They are actually giving priority to the very most recent cases. Those filed actually with the first 21 days of being in the United States. And that is after after January 29th of 2018. And the point of this was that they were trying to deter people from immediately entering the country and either at the border or at the port of entry when they you know, were encountering immigration as far as enforcement, that they were going to make that asylum claim. So this was to deter that, to deter those applications that had no merit. And they could then very quickly place these people into removal proceedings, which would then throw throw them into an, a defensive asylum application. This was because they thought most people were making that application just because they would eventually get work authorization. This is how you can see a little bit more about how they prioritize the processing. So the following order is how they're going to schedule the interviews. First is going to be any interview that either USCIS or the applicant asked to reschedule, such as the fact that right now, as of mid-March, the USCIS offices are closed. Once they reopen, these will be given first priority. The second priority are those brand new cases that have been pending 21 days or less, and then all other cases starting, which is in a row which you would normally think it's not first in, first out, it's actually last in, first out. So that again is to deter any frivolous filings, people who are maybe trying to just file to get their work authorization. Sometimes that works out, sometimes it doesn't, workload maybe doesn't allow for that to be as quickly as they would like. So the work authorization. If you are pending an application, you are not immediately authorized to apply for your work authorization. You may only apply if at least 150 days have passed since you filed your completed asylum application, either affirmative or defensive, and it starts over once you are defensive. So that means that you can also not have caused any of those delays. You cannot have forgotten a part of your application. You cannot have forgotten to sign it or uh, mailed it to the wrong place. It only really starts that clock when you have made a complete application and only while it is pending. 
This is a little bit more information if you want to go see it about that asylum clock, which is the term of art that we use to talk about that. And it was revised in 2018 under this current administration. Once you have been granted asylum, though, you are authorized to work without any other document. But most people will want to have that work authorization document because it is easier to use. It's, it's got your photo on it, and it also is a document that you can show the employers or HR that will make it a little more obvious to them when you're filling out your I-9 what it is that you have as far as work authorization. This is also very similar to refugee status. While you are living in the U.S., you will have an opportunity once you are granted asylum to make an application for lawful permanent residence one year after your grant of asylum and any time after that one year. We do have another webinar about lawful permanent residence, so I would encourage you to, to look at that one. I'm not going to give you the nuts and bolts of that in this seminar, but you can go and look at that. And also, like with refugees, you need to apply to travel abroad it's very likely that you will never be able to get a passport or a national document for your identification from your home country. One of the things that is available to you under the asylum and refugee process is what we call a travel document. You see here, it is this blue passport style book. And that is actually a picture of one. It is that color, that is what it looks like. And you need to obtain that prior to departing the United States. Otherwise you may not be able to reenter. And it's very important that you do not return to that country where you have a fear of persecution. That could jeopardize your asylum status. There's a little bit more at this USCIS site about that. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the intersection of CLCMA and asylees. In some ways, they are not very common for certain parts of the cases, but in other ways, we do see a lot of asylees and refugees in our cases where that may have been an underlying status in the past. So if it is a general asylum claim, either affirmative or defensive application that we generally will accept or recommend for our legal services. One of the reasons in that for an affirmative case is that when we are asking the government to act, we need to show that they've been unreasonable. And there is no specific published processing time for the affirmative asylum process. So we cannot say that a case that has been pending for several years is unreasonable. And that is what we would do in federal litigation, which I'm going to explain a little bit more how we do federal litigation here. Sometimes, though, we might have a case where the asylum is being challenged on national security grounds. That is part of our scope of service, and that may be one that we consider. As I said, when you're an asylee, after one year, you can apply for adjustment of status. There may be some things that were disclosed in your asylum application that are now being used against you in your adjustment of status that are discriminatory or a violation of civil rights or constitutional rights, those may be ones that we would accept or at least recommend to our board to accept. We do have some applications within our caseload where we are trying to help U.S. citizens that were naturalized to either apply for a passport or to get their passport back that was seized. Those individuals may have been on asylum status or refugee status. We do have one that I believe is probably being looked at more closely because they're from a country that is being looked at for fraudulent applications for asylum, generally as a country. And those are under the Operation Janus or Operation Second Look that our government is doing right now to challenge people's status, either as residents or as citizens especially. We do also have some people who are on the no-fly or the watch list that maybe we are helping or uh, directing to the DHS TRIP program and those people may have at one point had asylee status. Our civil litigation department has a great webinar on the watch list and no-fly. I would encourage you to go watch that. So now I'm going to tell you a little bit about our organization and what we do and how that might really affect these cases and whether or not we can help. So I'm in the immigration section. I'm the department head. Immigration has a wide variety of applications, and you'll see that through our webinar series. It has things like the asylum, refugees, and lawful permanent residents, citizenship, removal defense. Those are all the broad categories of immigration. They're very complex. Each one of them has its nuances, and it's important to know those when you're practicing immigration because there can be a lot of crossover, which is why we here, we do litigation in the federal courts. 
Sometimes we're doing those in the immigration court, but most often it is in the federal district courts or the appellate courts, or even some of our cases have gone to the Supreme Court. So we need to understand the underlying facts in immigration in order to know whether or not we can take that litigation case. And the same is true for our sections in the general civil lit and in criminal. We also have a section that does not compliance and they do seminars for groups of nonprofit organizations to help them to kind of adjust their practices to know that they are in compliance and are not in jeopardy of losing their nonprofit status. So there will also be some webinars from that section. Most immigration attorneys do not litigate cases. They do general cases. So they may be the person who is helping you apply for lawful permanent resident or citizenship or defending a case in removal proceedings. The understanding that we have is that impact litigation is very time intensive. So when we look at cases in any of our practice areas for litigation purposes, we're trying to narrow it down to the most impactful cases. And let me show you how that works. So we get hundreds of intakes a year throughout our different areas of practice. And what happens is we look at those, we give that internal consultation or that initial consultation to the person who has made that inquiry. And then we internally discuss it, make a recommendation to our board and our board votes, and they decide if that is a case within our scope. And if it is, and they decide to take it, it becomes one of our impact litigation cases. So when we're looking at impact litigation specifically, we're looking at cases where there has been discrimination and injustice by the U.S. government in the area of either constitutional law violations or civil rights violations based on race, religion, or country of nationality, and many times those involve complex facts related to national security. As the previous slide said, we do take fewer cases out of the hundreds of requests that we receive, but that's because we can only vigorously represent the cases that we have resources for. And we wanna do that because our point is to make a broad community impact with that individual case. We are not an organization who takes on hundreds of individuals for one issue and makes a big splashy lawsuit or joins with other nonprofit organizations or law firms and makes the headlines in a way that is national news, we try and do that very strategically and surgically where we take on very important cases that we can see the impact in the community, but it will take that one individual's case to make that change. And that's what we take to federal court hoping to change the government. So a lot of times I do get those inquiries and they are for general immigration cases. Sometimes people really want an attorney and sometimes they think, do I even need an attorney? because immigration at some point is seen by a lot of people as just filling out forms or very simple. They know lots of people who did it themselves. I think an attorney is not worth the money, but I'm here to tell you that there are many cases that we take on where people thought those things. And it's very, very important to consult with an attorney to see if you think that your case is simple, but they can see those pictures. So if we can't take your case, I do have the ability to give you some references generally. I don't refer you to a specific attorney, but when people come to me, if the answer is we cannot recommend you for services, what I will do for you is I will send you some resources, usually by email. And these are the general resources, but a lot of times I will narrow it down for the area of the country that someone is from. I hope that you've enjoyed this presentation and that you can watch the rest of our webinars, both the immigration and the other sections, and you will get some useful information out of that. Again, my name is Kate Brady, and I'm the Immigration Department Head at the Constitutional Law Center for Muslims in America. I thank you so much for your time. And if you have an inquiry that you think fits within our scope of services for impact litigation, where there has been discrimination on the basis of race, nationality, or religion by the United States government, I would appreciate it if you would go to our website and submit an inquiry and I look forward to speaking to you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.